little bit of limited there. Mm -hmm. Can I just check the uh, Okay, you blocked C721. You don't glide anterior. And the first ribs don't go lateral. This one does a bit. This one doesn't at all. You do that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it goes all the way through. On the left side, isn't that amazing how the most blocked is on the right, but the adaptation is over here on right the left. But as soon as I release this in here, this will start changing. May I? Oh God, heck yeah. Let's go. Oops. From the man himself, are you kidding me? I think I'm gonna turn that down. I want your shoulder line right here. <coughs> On my back? Yeah. left side of your neck released from what I've done. Mm -hmm. Well, that was secondary. I didn't need to. Yeah. See how it's moving in there? Yeah. Much better. Well, it's starting to go. side. talking about the lateral flexion thoracic move. Do you feel like you have to do that to clear that fixation, what you just did in lateral bend? Well, to me it's the easiest. Mm. You gotta have a soft table too. I don't care what you do, as long as you can come back and repalpate that it's it changed. Happened. Yeah. Yeah, feel the difference? Mm -hmm. So, elbows up, back, I want you 
the protract, retract, and brings out looking up. And we'll do that five or six times a day. And that, if you see a beater, too is just like early weight bearing yeah. it's like the earlier you can get them to like encourage them to walk on it and to yeah. feel and manipulation helps with that absolutely sure. but then the faster they can start walking on the faster they start yeah. to feel more confidence <coughs> and then the recovery goes down yeah. so even with like we we've, uh, we've had a rash of like atfl and tucking the fibular ruptures but like ankle surgeons aren't doing surgery on young healthy kids and so we're i mean we're we're progressing in a couple of weeks and they're back playing. I mean, yeah. so manipulation and then laser, dry needling, some other things like that. Yeah. And so, uh, manipulate, early manipulation is something everybody's scared to do. But what, what do you think makes the difference there? Like, what, what do you, why do you think that's so important? Well, the affrontation coming back from the joint mm -hmm. is really important mm -hmm. for the recovery. Mm -hmm. So if your brain still thinks it can't move, and it's not going to use the muscles in the way it wants to recruit them. Sure. <clears throat> so you're going to have a limp, you're going to have, you're just going to do all the things that are guarding against. Yeah. So it, the sooner you restore affrontation, the better. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. And then you talk in your book too about the long axis, you were talking about your ski trip. Yeah. Do you think that the sustained long axis just increases more and more ab affrontation or like what's what do you think differentiates the uh, no i think it gets holsters? compressed oh okay so it just decompresses the whole yeah. joint yeah gotcha yeah and uh well there's there's a lot of theory about centralizing isn't there burr and mckenzie yeah yeah and so i think it helps to to centralize it and therefore things are going back in the right oh way. yeah okay we we'll talk about that a lot well, joel johnson yeah yeah Mm -hmm. <coughs> and uh, I do it a lot with after I've done the shoulder manipulation I do a lot of centralizing mm -hmm. and I think it helps yeah. am I up? so, so is, it on? is it on? Oh, yeah. okay we're going okay Taylor you're patient today <laughs> let's go right so what I want you to do is to sit on this front stool, okay. and you're back to me, and I'm going to find out what I have to do today. Okay, sounds good. Okay. So I just switched the responsibility from them to me. Right? And that's what a patient wants. They want the doctor to be in charge. Right? They don't want to say, oh, I hurt here. And then you say, oh, well, I'll treat it there. Right? That's them deciding. So, oh, he's much more mobile. Oh, uh, he's got crazy extension, <laughs> I think. <laughs> much more mobile. Okay. So, can you feel the difference between that being restricted? And this not. Oh yeah. You can feel that difference? Definitely. Okay. Now this is blocked. So what would you like me to do as the doctor <laughs> in the way of treatment to improve this blockage here? Impulse that baby. <laughs> no. A patient would say, unblock it. Oh, unblock it. There you go. All right? So now they're asking for the manipulation. All right? It's not me telling them that's what I want to do. They're saying to me, 
let's get this unblocked. I think a hard thing too is everyone's got their own relative stiffness. So his stiff joint feels different than mine, feels different yeah. than you know a 10 year old kid. Yeah. And that makes it hard to teach, but that is like a real thing that you got to address. But when I got to here, yes, you can, it was blocked. Right. right. But you know what I'm saying on the yeah. relative stiffness? So we still don't know if it's what needs to be done. Right. So. You feel that when I try and flex it here? It doesn't feel great. We got a flexion loop coming And right what's here. on this side? Yeah, I felt that in my CT junction when you did that. This feels different than this one, right? Mm -hmm. Yep, definitely. Okay, what am I doing? I'm making the patient feel what I want to do, not understand. All right. If they understand, and then they go and meet somebody else who gives them an argument about what they understand, right? Now they're in their left brain flipping all around. Right? But when they go out of here, and they know they felt what I did, right? You can't argue with that. You feel it. It's really important. Mm -hmm. This is what they're missing when they go to chiropractic college and go into the clinic. They're told to explain and be scientific and all. That's for them. But when patient communication, you got to communicate feeling. He's really blocked in flexion. A to P rotation, a little bit blocked. Nothing on this side. Okay. So, what I need to do today is, this is a rib by the way, flexion and A to B rotation, all at this motion unit. He hasn't sweated, so he isn't in the <laughs> facilitation. So he probably doesn't have chronic inflammation into his shoulder or arm. But if you've got somebody with a rotator cuff tendonitis and their positive doorbell, right, they're facilitated from those sympathetics to their shoulder. And it's driving the inflammatory process. So you got to treat the shoulder, but you got to treat the neck as well. And there's one orthopedic in town that understands that. So, may I adjust you? Absolutely. You lie face down. Oh, I'm put your arm down there. Just let your shoulder go. Did we feel it move? Oh yeah. You did? Uh-huh. Lie on your back. So this is what you wanted? The ipsilateral? Yeah, that's what, yep. It's, so what I call it is anterior to posterior rotation. So a joint can go positive theta or negative theta. So that's P to A on the right, and that's A to P on the right. So with this motion, he would have had to be doing doing that, but the sympathetic ganglion chain is right there. 
and it's been shown. Butler mentions it in his book that it can be mechanically irritated. And Ruth Jackson mentioned it way back when, that it definitely can be irritated by the cervical spine. So, so I think uh, one of the questions people have is, would you be thrusting into an area that potentially be hypermobile, but what you're saying is, is that it's hypermobile from a P to A direction, but it's restricted in an A to P direction? Well, I don't even know if it's hypermobile in the other direction, but I do know it's restricted in A to P. A to P. Okay. So, uh, when I found this out, Gilles wrote in his notes that the cervical spine moves from P to A and A to P. So about the third year that I was going over there for my week, I said to him, what do you mean A to P, the cervical spine? He says, well, the joints go forwards P to A, and then they come back A to P. And I said, well, you never adjust them going back. So I started figuring out how to palpate that, and I found out that it usually instigated a doorbell sign and it was nearly always where they had some inflammatory condition. So I started adjusting them. I figured out how to adjust them. And people would turn bright red, get a real sleepy response, and the inflammation in their tendonitis or carpal tunnel or wherever it was started responding. Did I tell the story in the book about the MD having a bet with him? I don't think so. Yeah. I had an MD come in with tennis elbow, and he s said to me, I don't know why I'm here, but somebody said to me that you fixed up tennis elbows. I said, yeah. And uh, I said, I'm going to adjust your neck. And he said, you've got to be joking. He said, tennis elbow, it's blah, blah, blah. He knew all about what tennis elbow was. I said, yeah, I know. But uh, when the sympathetics are facilitated, it drives the inflammation from whatever you did to become a chronic tennis elbow. So I'll tell you what, we'll have a $200 bet. I won't touch your elbow. I won't put therapy on it. I won't do anything. And I'll treat your neck. And in six to eight weeks, if your tennis elbow isn't gone, we'll open up the envelope and you can have my 200. Or if it is gone, we'll open up the envelope and I'll have your 200. He said, I can't believe it, right? <laughs> he said, all right, you're on. So he gave 200 and the nurse put it in his envelope, stuck it in the drawer. And sure enough, you know, six or seven weeks, the tennis elbow was clear. He said, that's the damnedest thing. I said, no. Bosbaum and Levine did the research on that, and you can go and read about it. Now, I've told chiropractors to go and read Bosbaum and Levine's papers. Craig Levinson introduced me to Bosbaum and Levine, and I think it was Bosbaum that came to lecture at LACC once, but it might have been Levine, and they showed how the sympathetics could be irritated and drive chronic inflammatory conditions. And so what does Advil do? It stops that process. It blocks the PG2 that the sympathetic nerves cause the mast cells to produce. So his, the Bosbaum research ended up producing Advil, not manipulation. <laughs> <laughs> but what I'm going to do to him... More money in the Advil. <laughs> so. I'm going to put pressure on it. I'm going to reach under from the other side, and I'm going to slide with my contact. I'm going to make the scalenes taut an impulse. And then I'm going to turn the neck so that these are still facing forward. 
And then go ahead and cause flexion. Just let your neck drop. rotation. Is that less tender? Oh yeah. Wait a so then what I do is I go down with my thumb and I do a rolfing over the scaling. And usually when you go by the spot that you just adjusted, the patient will feel the pain up into here or out to the shoulder. right about there, right? Yeah, right there. Is that the most painful right there? Mm, yeah, right there. Does it radiate anywhere? Uh, it did initially in my, in my shoulder, but yeah. actually now it's going into my ear. Yeah. They get better faster when I do this. I don't, I don't know why. Okay. But clinically I found out that if I do this rolfing move, and sometimes I do it this way, and sometimes I do it that way. Okay. And then, what nobody does, unless they've been to MPI or original MPIs, I say to the patient, come on back and let me check to see if what I wanted to do actually happened. Right. So you don't go out of here until you know right. it's happened. <laughs> Lynn, I think it might be good for them to hear. I, and I, we don't use um, the palpation chair in our office. Yeah. We use a variation of that, but I like what you said. What did you say that the reason you like that? Yeah, the reason is that I can swim around. And it's also a different experience for the patient, right? Yeah. Like it's a different almost service that's yeah. recognized. They're, they're by them. coming here to be palpated for me to find out what I'm going to do. And then they come back here to find out whether I did it or not. And quite often I have to go back and do it again. Right. Because it didn't happen. Something right. cracked, but I don't know what it was. It wasn't what I wanted. Right? So. So we still got super mobility. It's got great mobility of that first rib again. Maybe 50% better. You got to do this when he gets home. <laughs> Happily. Right? <laughs> because this is really, it's a forerunner to trouble. So I believe in seeing a patient every now and again for uh, a maintenance care mm -hmm. because I can find something before it's symptomatic. Mm -hmm. right. If you're just doing the flying seven, it doesn't make sense. Right. But if you're palpating or doing some kind of screening or whatever, and you know that you're finding things that are before they complain of them, then you have the right to. Uh, that's what a yearly blood checkup is, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Find stuff happening before it becomes the real disease. Yeah. Okay. Let's say you had a lateral flexion dysfunction of the upper thoracics mm -hmm. and that you couldn't you couldn't laterally flex to the left which means the vertebra have to open on the right, right? it's probably the right joint that doesn't open as opposed to the left joint that doesn't compress so Line. Is that how you would joint play it, just how you did there? You, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, so if, if he doesn't move, then I have to lie him on his right side. Yeah. So 
that? Yeah. But now the camera won't see you, will it? Oh, it's okay. It has an upside down angle. Yeah, it'll be able to see it. So what I do, I put them so that their spine is perpendicular to the table. I put the head up. As you know, in the book, it talks about activating so that the antagonist relaxes, mm. right? It's a nice little trick or whatever. So now I got to get my thumb on the spinous, and to hold him perpendicular, I'll put my sternum on his shoulder. And now I'm going to thrust with my sternum and my thumbs. So just relax. And we got a little movement. All right. It's comfortable. It's the most missed adjustment in chiropractic. And it's, it's really important. Mm. How many patients have I helped with that manipulation? Do you do any variation uh, supine or prone? Or do you feel like you can get lateral flexion in those situations? I'll do mid to lower thoracic lateral flexion prone. Mm -hmm. All right. mm -hmm. But in that region, that's the way I do it. Okay. Cool. And would you do anything different for a rotation fixation there? Or are you of the belief if you clear lateral flexion that it No, no, I got to do H of them. Okay. Turn Could you show back. how you joint play rotation? Turn on your back. Mm -hmm. If I wanted to do rotation, I'll show the palpation after. Yep. What I'm going to do is I'm going to bring him at 45, and I'm going to place my knuckles along just inside the costotransverse joint. So just a unilateral contact to yeah. do some rotation. And then, so I go past the spinuses and into that groove. I'll get him to bring his ear to here. There you go. And then I'm just going to push. That'll cause rotation of the of the rib. So come on over here. So I'm going to take. I got to keep him straight here. And then go all the way down. Do you ever manipulate from that position on a rib, or, or do you always do it supine? Yeah, I always do it supine, supine. because it'll, it'll tear the, you'll get the lumbars. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. I had somebody once came into my office in Ottawa. He was an old classmate of mine. And, uh, he said, oh, I've just learned how to do the upper lumbar sitting. And I said, oh. He said, yeah, i got to show you. So he sat me like this, and he took a contact. Mm -hmm. And then the next thing I knew, he ripped me about three inches. And it took me two years to get over it. <laughs> right. yeah, I mean, he literally sprained all the ligaments. <laughs> right. <laughs> It was, was a, it an enraged? It was a mess. I have a similar story of a knee chest table that I don't know if it was an acute spondylolisthesis, but I had a spondy after that. And that was my that was my intro to chiropractic yeah. school. Oh <laughs> Show us the famous seven shoulder joint place oh, while you got him here. Right. So lie on your back. So this morning. I had somebody with an impingement syndrome three visits ago. So when you brought his arm across, it hurt right in here. Mm -hmm. What is your impingement test? You probably do something else. Mm -hmm. I mean, we use empty can or we use, uh, that's probably near impingement. Yeah. There's some, some variation of adduction and internal rotation. Yeah. So what I did, he, uh, 
his rotator was a little inflamed, so he couldn't get up behind his back. But anyways, I did the seven tests that I do. I get way up in here and see if it's lateral. See, that comes lateral. Anterior, posterior. If, if that was missing, I would impulse up, impulse down, impulse laterally. Right? Then I go at 45 and see if it goes into the back. 90, see if it goes into the back. Does that hurt a bit there? Uh, it just feels tight. Yeah, there's a little restriction there. Now I'm going to bring it lateral and posterior. So I bring it out and down. Out and down. And it goes out and down. And then I bring it out and inferior. If, if that is restricted, impulse. If this is restricted, impulse. Perfect. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. But that's only the manipulation. I got to treat the inflammation. I got to treat the rest of the girdle. I've got to give him anti-inflammatories. I use Wobenzyme, things like that. Mm. If he's really skitzy about things, I'm going to talk to him about relaxation and meditation and things like that. Lord knows I need that. Hmm? I said, Lord knows I need that. <laughs> so. Well, that was great. Do you have anything that you... Um, I don't think so. Well, I'm going to say once again, for 60 years of experience and $29 at Amazon.com, a student can really understand what it is they're trying to do and why they're trying to do it with references. They got to read Salter, they got to read Bosbaum and Levine, they got to read all these. For some reason, they're not being told to read those at chiropractic colleges. Mm -hmm. Just like my book, the original book was a textbook and nobody used it as a textbook. It, uh, it's sad. And what's the ultimate goal? For the student to become a skilled palpator and manipulator so that they know there's nobody else around them that can do this. Mm. And they'll get super outcomes and they'll get so much business that they'll actually end up with a professional income. <laughs> and they won't need to be experts at marketing and I don't know how you can market a, a bad outcome right you might get them in with the marketing but two or three visits and they're gone and we all know that the, those that fail at chiropractic don't see patients often enough to get a really good outcome right what's a really good outcome not just pain relief tissue changes right change in function yeah change in Function. I do tissues. I do have one more request. Should we make you do a little side posture too? Yeah, sure. Could you show like a lumbar or an SI joint or something like sure. that? Yeah. Oh, what what are your thoughts on the SI joint? That is one thing that because mm -hmm. the SI joint seems to be the joint that everyone struggles with the most as far as not adjusting it, but uh, getting an agreement on whether or not it's blocked. Well, first of all, you have to understand that. The old-fashioned idea that you flex it on one side and you extend it on the other, mm -hmm. that's nonsense. Right. It has to flex and extend on both sides. Right? Mm -hmm. So when you're taking a swinging step, the anomatous is flexing against the sacrum. On the other side, the sacrum is flexing against the anomatous. Mm -hmm. Right? And then when you swing your other leg, this right side has to flex against the anomaly, which we call extension mm. of the anomaly. And the other side has to be flexing against the sacrum. 
So there's four manipulations that are in question. And how do we know which four need to be done? Well, I use a consensus, right? If you could come and stand in front of me. Am I going to be in your way here? No. So if you stand on your left leg and lift your right knee, right, and down. So I felt the innominate, the PSIS, go slightly inferior. He didn't tilt his knee to get that action because you know the brain will do whatever it has to do to answer the command to lift your knee. So if it doesn't happen at the hip joint and the sacroiliac, it'll happen at the other knee. All right? And then the second compensation, do that again, he doesn't tilt. So what happens is to raise that knee, the body makes a movement at the hip joint and tilts the pelvis. So some papers have kind of questioned parts of Jalay's test of you know how yeah. reliable it is. What what do you what's your take on that? I agree. If you just do it trying to palpate it, mm -hmm. there's never going to be agreement, right? But if you take in observing the opposite knee, whether it flexes or not, and you take in whether the pelvis tilts or not, then you you know that that SI isn't functioning properly. And you do, come here again. Mm -hmm. So this time I'm gonna have you leave my thumbs in the same place and lift your left knee. That's it. No knee motion, no hip tilt. And this time the sacrum flexed because it's the swinging step. So I felt both flexion and extension of the right SI joint. No adaptive, okay? Let's say I did find the right sacroiliac didn't function. Lie on your back. Are you aware of Andy Fleming? Oh yeah, compression right. test. Andy, Andre Fleming had patients lift six inches above, hold your leg there. I want you to tell me how much effort that takes compared to holding your leg on the side that I felt wasn't functioning properly. This one feels harder. Yeah. So, second test positive. Now, was it the hip joint that caused that test to be bogus? Fab error is normal. Fab error is normal. Now if you find the positive SIs and the fab errors stick up in the air, well of course they're going to have be tilting and everything because their hip won't move. What do you like for actual is there any joint plays or anything you like for the? Yeah. Yeah. Turn on your side. This is part of the consensus. Mm. I like to feel, does the joint gap on both so sides? You're just adducting his femur and feeling. Yeah, I'm using this as the lever. Right. then I'll compress, because sometimes patients say they have pain in their SI joint, mm -hmm. and it's coming from T12 L1, right. main syndrome, right? So I'll push down and ask them if that hurt. That feel great. Yeah. What about just springing the joint from the seated scan position? Do you not, is that yes. hard for, yeah. Yeah, I kind of get a sense that way, but I found teaching that is really hard. Right, you need a battery of tests, yeah. uh, and that's what we still teach that, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, there was something I thought of about the SI joint. Oh, 
slipped my mind. Sure. Do you do you palpate the lumbar spine from this position as well? No, I do everything on the same. Uh-huh. Gotcha. gotcha. When I leave here with the patient, I know what I'm going to do. Gotcha. Right. And then I go back and see if I did it. Yeah. And then I'll say to the patient, I'll see you Wednesday or Friday, okay. and we'll see how you respond to what I've done. Right. It'll be moving a little better, or this area of your back will start to move. So I can use it as a barometer. I might have to go and treat that. Right. Right. But the patient knows I've got a plan. And the patient knows they can feel what my plan is. Right. They don't have to understand it. Uh, yeah. Okay. Advertising people know that feeling is more important than understanding. Why would Ford have Bambi jumping across the road? <laughs> oh. <laughs> That lovely Ford. <laughs> right. Uh, why do politicians go and shake hands with the baby? Right. Uh, 